Yo, dude. Hello. Sorry, mate. I'm going to be a little bit late. Someone put paint everywhere, didn't they? Yes. <laughs> uh, Johnny, sorry, mate. I'll be about 15 minutes. We're about to start the second sitting with Jamie. What I did last time, which you may have seen, was just do a little, quite a thinly painted, uh, slightly sketchy, what's this drawing with paint. I wasn't trying to make it three dimensional, I was just trying to put some core elements down. It's not very accurate, partly because we were having quite a fun conversation, but that's not a problem with oil paints because you can change them as much as you need to. And I find Anyway, it's often easier to edit into something that's already there rather than worry about trying to get it right from scratch. But hopefully this time we'll start to actually make it a bit more solid and three-dimensional. That's the sort of aim with it. We'll see how it goes. What have you been doing on today's sitting so far? I made a start last time. I came in then a couple of days later and saw that some bits are good. This always happens. Some bits are good, some bits not. And so you then try and think, well, okay, let's not, which of the bits I don't want to mess up just yet. You may end up changing the whole thing totally. So I did that thing of saying where I sketched it, I'd sketch it out in sort of paint. And I'm doing a bit more of that, trying to correct the thing. So I put, I, you know, add your eyes slightly in the wrong place. It tends to be not as photographically accurate, but often you, it, it somehow often more like the person than if you'd done it sort of like painstakingly looking at photos. Um, how are ya? I'm good, actually. How's your week? Week's been good. Getting into the groove of this sort of lockdown <laughs> thing now. I guess, I guess possibly the most powerful thing is it makes people stop and think. Yeah. I think lots of people are rightly questioning, mm. have I got this right? Yeah. What really matters to me? Is this that sort of Jerry Maguire moment, you know, when you like think actually, hang on, you know, it's all going perfectly well, but... This is, is this really what I want to spend my next 20 years doing? What makes you really happy? What makes mm. you, you know, what's enough? Yeah. Family's obviously terribly important. Mm. And of course, that's generally sort of number one on the priority. Of course, there's work. Even friendships. Me and you and some of the other boys hook up, what, four times a year, five times a year? Yeah. I mean, it's more than just cards, isn't it? We all come from busy families and... <laughs> responsibility and it's just yeah I think the simple things what do you call the person you're painting your um... sitter subject victim <laughs> victim yeah I'm so lucky that I get to paint you know, you know some really interesting and diverse people very often for, for both of you it turns into a bit of therapy so you have this thing where you're, you're actually kind of having these a fairly wide-ranging and sometimes deep chats with a relative stranger and it's a very interesting way to get to know someone you always form a bond basically even if you don't end up uh sort of like keeping in you know sort of like touch so much that you see each other all the time you know i don't think i've lost totally lost touch with that many of the people i've painted uh and so, quite a few have ended up really sort of proper friends after it as well it's nice what's your favorite things to eat ah do you know what I'm really missing at the moment is, is seafood um, because our local fishmonger in Barnes is brilliant. It's been, been shut up. One of, one of my favourite things that I remember was, was going to, uh, what's the place on the coast of Morocco? Essaouira, where they have all the, that, have you been there, that big harbour where they, all the fishing boats come in and they have all those shacks frying fish on the, next to the, the harbour. Um, uh, and um, I just love that thing of, you know, what, almost whatever the fish is, if it's just come out of the, Water, it's, it's a, such an amazing thing. I love all the kind of um, things that you do. When I come around to yours at home or, or to um, the uh, studio and when we're playing cars and stuff, there's some things, all those things which are like, to me, like the things you know you always imagine you could cook at home but are never going to make the effort to do it because it's always just a little bit more to go wrong. Um, do you remember that big turbot that we did with gravy? Yeah, amazing. That was, that was quite an unusual but brilliant combo, wasn't it? Yeah. And so is that one of your standards or is that something you were trying No, out? I just kind of had fun with it that day. Yeah. Like a whole turbot, you know, probably the cleanest, chunkiest, most flaky Aston Martin of fish. And then to have that with a really good, well-made chicken gravy. Yeah. It was a thing of joy, wasn't it? Yeah. I remember you were cooking monkfish once and it was just the most incredible tent. I mean, I... I guess I'd never really sort of like done it properly before, but it always ended up a bit chewy when I cooked it at home. And then suddenly having this thing, which was just 
kind of so such an extraordinary melt in the mouth experience. It's like, wow. I think I didn't believe it was monkfish. I'd ask your guys about five times. Yeah, yeah. I thought they'd well, do you it. You know monkfish. where the key was there is, and not many people do it, is you, you make a brine with water and lots of salt. And then you put a bit of lemon zest in and you just twist a few herbs. And then when you put a monkfish fillet in that, um, probably what you would notice from cooking it, you get like milky goo come out of it when you, when you roast it. Um, so when you put it in a, a like a, a flavoured seawater like brine, it pulls all of that away. And uh, instead of getting like woolly meaty fish, you get flaky meaty fish. But it's just it's interesting. Just a little bit of love. You've only got to do it for half an hour, and it completely transforms the texture and the way it cooks. And so, how do you know that shit? I mean, do you, is that is that a standard thing? That have you picked it up from someone? I spent a bit of time in Eric Chaveau's kitchen who was the head chef at the Capitol for a long time. Brilliant French chef. But, you know, as you work with different chefs from different countries, you just pick up different techniques, different things, um, and you see things that are sworn by law to be the only way to do something. Yeah. You see someone else break those, and then you start trying to work out, okay, well, why, why would they say that? What's technically have it happening? So, yeah, it's basically like, um, and it could be a chef, it could be a nonna, it could be a mistake that went right. Um, so yeah, then you just kind of put it together. Even when I went to Italy and I was um, sort of working with these ladies that were doing a Roman version of fish and chips, they would lightly salt their cod an hour before they cooked it. And when you think about it, what's the most important thing with fish and chips? It's a crispy batter. And the thing that makes it go soft and soggy is steam, which is water. So by seasoning it an hour before you cook it and then patting it off, You've just removed the residual water, therefore it yeah. won't steam. Therefore, the, their batter was like so crisp. So you think, oh, is it the batter? What's the recipe for the batter? What's the recipe for the batter? Because it's it's a standard recipe. It's just the preparation beforehand. So it's it's it's, it's kind of no different than when you you use that like some crazy oil to stop your your paints drying. What's that yeah, oil? Clo you use? Clove oil. Um, yes. I just I kind of picked it up from some old art book somewhere that that's what some some of the kind of painters in previous centuries used. Um, but it's sort of like it's forgotten about because then in the 20th century, there were kind of like people were experimenting stylistically all the time. And a lot of the things were more about doing painting in layers. So you want it to dry quickly so you could come back and do another layer on it. The thing of being able to work into wet <clears throat> paint to carry on, you know, moving the paint around for days or more. Um, is something which you know, is, is a bit more of a niche thing. and A different style, right. It's not something you're taught. What's the biggest painting you've ever done? I've done a few that are about that are six feet square. Um, which, wow. Uh, is, is that harder? It is, you have to kind of like pull, you know, when I'm working on something this size, I'm sort of like half sat on a stool, I'm staying about the same distance away. The bigger it gets, the more you are working very close on one part of it, but then have to pull right back to see the whole thing and you know, make sure you're not, you, know, you're, you can't take the whole thing in at a glance. So there's another funny thing which happens, which is when you are painting on a bigger canvas and like you've got a subject, someone sitting there, it's a bit like using a really wide angle lens for a photograph because you know, you're not just looking there. You, if, you, if, it's, if it's kind of big and you're doing it big, when you're, when you're looking at their feet, you're right above them. So you've got to look down and then you're painting it on, on the canvas. And then if you're looking at their head, you're looking at them from underneath. Oh, so like weird perspective stuff. You've got this thing where then the painting, you know, if you look at it from a distance or you kind of like look at a reproduction of it, it looks like you've distorted things because the, you know, the head's from underneath and the feet are from right above. <laughs> but of course, you were just doing what you were seeing. Um, and so what do you do then? Do you correct that? But then it's not, you know, then it's like, you know, um, uh, problematic, like how do you correct it? And also is it you, then you're getting away from the, you know, the actual experience you had of looking at something. Tattoos are definitely like a, a fairly, I guess, new thing. Artists of millennia that have passed probably didn't have to put up with well-known subjects that were in the public eye, whoever they might be, Lord, Lady, Queen, do you ever go, oh, I didn't know you had a little um, fox's <laughs> tail popping out of there. Um, should we not, do you have to like avoid those or do you paint them in? Or like, is that a conversation you have with your subject? It depends how much it's part of 
their identity, I guess, really. Idris Elba got like lots everywhere, um, and but none of them were on his face, so we wanted to see a bit of it. So I kind of like got his like arms and everything with all the tattoos. And then also um, with Kara, because obviously she's got that one of her lion on her finger and sort of like one or two quite distinctive ones. And obviously, you know, that's part of who she is and she's known for it. And so you wanted to get that in. Um, but certainly when I was at school you know, in the 80s, it was something which, you know, people's elder brothers and uncles had. Either it was associated to like you know, being in the Navy and that kind of thing, or just it was a bit of a biker thing or something from... Yeah, there was definitely a, sort of a bit of a thing, I guess, in the sort of 60s and 70s with it. And then it was out of fashion. You know, for the last 20 years, it's been a big thing again. Um, so I don't know, it'd be interesting to see whether it's like, it's always around now, or if it comes and goes like a kind of, as a fashion thing. It's like, yeah, obviously all the, all the, all the facial hair at the moment. Because there was obviously a, a Victorian fashion for really extravagant beards. And actually, because and, 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 that, and that, that's one of the funny things about the current one is, is it's very, but you know, like that. It just broke. It did break. Yeah. See, this 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 chair has had a lot of grief over the last month and a half. Uh, let me just. Uh, sorry, dude. What what? So what are you doing the rest of the weekend? Are you? So I am just going to attempt to be a good husband and a good dad this weekend. So I will be cooking breakfast, lunch and dinner. Do the kids cook for you much? I try and get them all involved. But Buddy seems to be my nearest hope at the moment. He's, he, he, he cooks quite a lot. We're, um, we're trying to launch a little kids cooking club online. And Buddy's done a handful of recipes and they've gone down better than mine. Can you believe that? Like he's totally smashed my numbers. Um, <laughs> Hey, look, I think, I think we're good. Um, you happy? Yeah. All right, mate, have a lovely night. You, you too. Uh, give you my too. love to your, uh, your better half. And um, <laughs> okay, exactly, likewise. I think that session went quite well. The shape of the face is better and it's definitely becoming more three-dimensional and there's something there now, um, which is good. Uh, the eyes aren't right still. Uh, and there's obviously a lot to do, but it feels like it's a step in the right direction. So I'm, yeah, cautiously optimistic.